The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, welcome everybody to Coffee with Kalefi. Um, excited about the topic today. I think this is a, uh, a timely topic in that you see a lot more low temperature equipment, heat pumps and stuff coming out. So I think uh, this is gonna be good information for everybody. And, uh, and of course, every time we have John Siggy Sigenthaler on board, I think we all leave a presentation like this, uh, uh, maybe a degree or two smarter. And uh, of course that would be Celsius, you're up in Canada, but. And then, uh, yeah, so a new look, the 25, uh, anniversary issue here is uh, coming out. It's it's printed. It should be on the streets here within the next week or two. So look for that. Uh, you'll notice a new look on that. That's kind of a global look. Uh, that's what they'll see over in Italy with the hydraulica issue that they have over there. And, uh, uh, you know, we pride ourselves in education. I like to think is our education is as good as our product out there. I think we're at the top of the heap or certainly near the top of the heap when it comes to uh, you know, training, you know, with the webinars, with the hydronics and everything we do. So hopefully uh, uh, we always look for input on that. So if you can Tell us what you need out there. We'll try and get it to you. Um, okay, what do you got? There's our guy. I'll let you take it away and I'll put my phone on mute here. So uh, thanks, ahead, Bob. Sydney. Thanks. Good to be here. And I, I know we've got a good size audience and we've got a lot of material. And uh, as Bob was saying, the material today is uh, it's just a prelude of what is in Hydronics number 25. Uh, it's a very uh, timely topic. It's a, uh, it's a major issue that the North American uh, hydronics industry is facing. So we'll start off with uh, the fact that most existing, and I, I use the term legacy hydronic heating systems were designed around high water temperatures. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, originally, going way back before circulators, uh, before roughly 1933, I believe is when the first electric powered circulator came out, uh, any hydronic system, water-based system, uh, had to use high temperatures uh, to basically create circulation using thermosiphoning. So there's a, a drawing of a very early, probably turn of the century um, hydronic system. And uh, if you look through there, you'll see there's no circulator involved. So, and of course those systems, once circulators came into existence, uh, most of the heat sources back then were burning either a fossil fuel or wood, coal as was a common fuel. So with combustion temperatures up around 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, it's easy to produce, let's say 200 degree water. And of course, when you have those high water temperatures, the size of the heat emitter for a given rate of heat output uh, goes down as the water temperature goes up. So it, it, uh, the cost of energy was not as much of a concern. The, uh, the carbon footprint really, I don't, I don't think there was any concern over that at that point in time. So all these factors kind of combined to make the default for hydronics high water temperatures. Um, here's an example, uh, another application that kind of counted on keeping the boiler hot, and that is a tankless coil water heater, where we've got uh, just a copper coil immersed in a boiler. And even in the summer, that would hold a minimum temperature, that boiler probably about 140 degrees. Um, so again, smaller emitters, uh, cost less, fuels were abundant, seemingly abundant, they were cheap, and the combustion process could easily produce those high water temperatures. Now we fast forward to uh, current day where there's a lot of interest in both renewable sources and, and uh, non-renewable. I've got a modulating condensing boiler down as an example of a high efficiency fossil fuel heat source. And all of these devices, be it heat pumps, boilers, solar collectors, pellet boilers with storage, the universal concept is they all perform best at low water temperatures. So that sets up kind of a, a quandary. We have probably tens of thousands of existing hydronic systems that were designed, I, I would say pretty much anything designed prior to the 1980s and, and even even up through the 1980s to, uh, in some cases, were designed around relatively high water temperatures. This is a period of time before radiant panel heating really had much of a uh, impact on the market. Uh, and again, what do we do when we want to take one of those legacy systems and bring it over to a contemporary heat source such as a, a geothermal heat pump system? So we've got this kind of fundamental mismatch between 
many types of contemporary heat sources and these existing distribution systems. So the, the, uh, the concept or the whole uh, objective of Hydronics 25 and, and today's Coffee with Kalefi is to talk about methods to take those older systems and modify either the system or the building or both and assess what impact that would have on the water temperature. And as I mentioned, I, I feel that um, this mismatch between the contemporary heat sources that the market is, is adopting and, and the adoption rate is, is, if anything, accelerating based on concepts like decarbonization and so forth. There are many incentive programs, uh, national and state level programs that are encouraging use of these contemporary heat sources. And if these are just dropped in as a replacement for a boiler and there's no attention given to the distribution system, they're going to function poorly, if at all. So we, we really want to try to bring that distribution system back to a point where it's going to allow good performance with that contemporary heat source. So let's look in a little bit more detail here with uh, modulating condensing boilers. And of course, there's uh, probably a couple dozen different manufacturers uh, out there, but fundamentally they, they share the concept that when we can bring the water temperature below the dew point of the water vapor in the exhaust gases, we can get a significant boost in performance. And this graph shows the idea, uh, what's called the performance envelope. And basically the, the upper blue line in this envelope is the efficiency of that boiler as a function of the boiler inlet water temperature on the bottom. And it's specific to a condition where the boiler is operating at 25% of its rated capacity. What this does is it, it takes, if you will, a smaller flame and spreads it over the same heat exchange area as when the flame is at full power. So we do tend to get better heat transfer and as a result, we get higher efficiency. But you can see right in this area here, there's quite an inflection in that efficiency curve. We are gaining as we drop our inlet water temperature from 200 down through maybe to 150, 140, we're gaining small amounts, maybe one and a half, two percent, but then it really starts to pick up once we get into the condensing mode of operation. Now the lower curve is essentially the same thing, but assuming the boiler is firing at full capacity. So again, the best performance with a modulating condensing boiler is going to be in a low temperature system. There are systems I, I have heard and seen systems where these boilers are just cut in as a replacement to a, perhaps a cast iron boiler and there's no change to the distribution system. There's still going to be some benefit, but it, it's a marginal benefit compared to an optimal benefit. Solar thermal collectors, uh, you know, whether they're flat plate collectors or evacuated tubes, again, they're going to perform better at lower fluid temperatures. And in this case, we're looking at some flat plate collectors. And over on the right, you see the graph and uh, the, the efficiency of that collector is just being plotted against actually what's uh, a combination of three operating conditions, uh, the inlet temperature, the air temperature around the collector and the, the uh, intensity of the solar radiation. We call that the inlet fluid parameter. So just to show you a difference, if we were operating these collectors on a winter day when it's 20 degrees outside, relatively cold winter day, but a nice sunny day where we have 250 BTUs per hour per square foot of solar radiation intensity. If we operate that with an inlet fluid temperature of 170, we're getting roughly about 20, we're capturing about 25% of the solar energy that strikes the collector and actually transferring that into the fluid. But if we leave the ambient conditions the same, but operate the collector at 110, which would bring it down in the range of, for example, radiant panel heating, look at how much our efficiency goes up. It doesn't quite double, but it goes up substantially. Uh, so again, those lower temperatures are going to glean more solar radiation and convert it into useful heat. Geothermal heat pumps, a lot of interest in these now, uh, state level programs, uh, federal level tax incentive programs. Uh, it's the same story with coefficient of performance. 
Uh, you see the graph over on the right there. Uh, you've got three different lines. Uh, that upper line, where we have the highest COP, what we're doing there is plotting coefficient of performance against the entering loop water temperature. This would be the temperature of the source water, either coming from a well, a lake, or perhaps a, a loop of tubing buried in the ground. Um, and for three different entering load water temperatures. Now, the load water temperature or entering load water temperature, that's the temperature of the fluid coming back from the heating load. So perhaps coming back from a radiant panel or a fin tube, whatever that system is. And you can see here that the blue line definitely where the entering load water temperature is 80 degrees. Now that would have to be a very low temperature, probably a, a low temperature radiant floor, but that's definitely giving us the highest coefficient of performance. Uh, and as we increase that entering load water temperature and increment it up by 20 degree increments, you'll see the, the COP drops off and it's, it's a significant drop. So again, for optimal versus adequate performance on a geothermal water to water heat pump, we wanna try to match that up with a low temperature distribution system. Um, air to water heat pumps, uh, again, a growing market niche. Uh, you could pretty much summarize this with any heat pump. As we bring the temperature that the condenser of the heat pump operates at down, and in a hydronic system, we do that by lowering the water temperature, or I should say by creating a distribution system that can operate at low water temperatures, we get an improvement in the coefficient of performance. And we also get an improvement in the heating capacity. The heat pump will actually transfer more BTUs per hour when it's operating at that lower water temperature. Now, the change in capacity is noticeable, but it's not as significant as the change in coefficient of performance. Um, and, and a coefficient of performance is, is very important. It's that ratio of that output per unit of electrical input. So we always want to operate any heat pump at the highest possible coefficient of performance. And uh, this is gonna be our first poll question. We were just talking about air to water heat pumps. Um, it's a relatively new product in the North American market, but globally it's used pretty extensively. So our first poll is, are you familiar with how they, how an air to water heat pump can be used in a hydronic heating and cooling system? All right, here we go. Oh, yes, 60%, no, 40%. Well, I'm glad okay. we're on the positive side of that. Okay, good, good. Let's move on here. Um, let's see, go back here. Okay, uh, so we've talked about several different low temperature sources. And uh, I've been quite involved with biomass boiler systems over the last five years, uh, pellet boilers and cordwood gasification boilers. And I, I think sometimes when I say that low water temperatures are, are important for good performance, people question, uh, they question that and they think, gee, can't these boilers produce 170, 180 degree water? And the answer is yes, they can. They can actually produce up to about 200 degree water. But the key concept here is not the water temperature limit that the, the pellet boiler can produce. These pellet boilers always operate best when they're combined with a thermal storage tank. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's a fairly large tank uh, on the order of two gallons of storage per thousand BTUs of rated boiler capacity. And the, the concept is pretty simple. We're going to turn the pellet boiler on. We're going to run it flat out for a fairly long period of time. We'd like to see three or four hour run cycles. These are, are very different from turning on a gas boiler or an oil boiler. So during that time, we're at mostly near steady state efficiency. And we also have the lowest emissions when we're at that high efficiency point. So what we're trying to do is, is charge up this thermal storage tank, just like you would charge up a battery. And once we get up to some limiting temperature, we're going to shut off the pellet boiler. And now the duration of the off cycle, which again, we'd like to be as long as possible before we refire that pellet boiler, that's going to be largely determined by how low can we bring the water temperature of the tank before the water can no longer supply the load. So the graphs over on the right, <clears throat> it shows you, if we, we look at the, uh, the, the uh, one there, 
that has the fin tube baseboard on it, you'll see there's a green sloping line. It says pellet boiler start. That's an outdoor reset criteria to turn the, the pellet boiler on. And the pellet boiler shuts off when the tank gets up to 180 degrees. So that yellow area between the green line and the red line represents, in effect, the usefulness of thermal storage. Now, look at the graph on the far right. We've just changed from a fin tube distribution system or heat emitter over to a radiant panel system. We're using another outdoor reset line, but you'll see it's much, much lower, and we have a lot more yellow area on that graph. So by charging the tank to a relative, well, we're charging in this case to, to the same high temperature each time before we shut off the boiler, but our ability to bring that tank down to a much lower temperature and still satisfy the heating load really um, improves the performance of this system, getting long on cycles, long off cycles, and getting optimal thermal efficiency and, and minimal emissions from these. So again, low water temperatures. So we, we've talked about the importance of this. So how do you do this? Well, there's basically two things you can do to bring the water temperature uh, down. One is to reduce the design load of the building and simply leave the existing distribution system in place. As we make performance improvements to the building, whether it be added insulation or changing the windows or reducing air leakage, we're, we're reducing the amount of heat transfer that those emitters collectively have to create. So we're reducing the water temperature requirement because of the rate of heat transfer reduction. And oftentimes that's a very practical and cost effective starting point, especially if you're dealing with what I'll affectionately call an energy hot building. Uh, you know, if you've got a 1850s farmhouse where if it's a windy day outside, you can't keep the candles lit on a dining room table, you need to do something about that before you just, just put in a heat pump, let's say. So uh, load reduction is one strategy, and the other strategy is simply to increase the surface area of the emitters. And there's many subcategories of that. We could add more of the same type of emitter. We could add other types of emitters. Uh, we can create zones in the process, and we're going to get into some of those piping details a little later on. And I should say, you can also use a combination of these two, uh, where each situation presents its own set of circumstances from aesthetics, cost, logistics of accessing the piping and so forth. So a combination of load reduction and added heat emitters is certainly a possibility. So we're going to start with uh, building load reduction. And I'll throw a little math at you. Very simple. Uh, the water temperature requirement at design load basically comes down in proportion to the reduction in the load itself. So if, if we know what, a, uh, what the design water temperature is at an existing condition, and then we assess how much of that existing design load can we uh, reduce, we can use this formula to calculate what that new design load temperature will be. And just to give you a quick example, let's say we're starting with a building with 100,000 BTU per hour design load, and through building envelope improvements, we bring that load down to 70,000. So we're, we've done about 30% reduction in design load. And let's say the original building at 100,000 required 180 degree Fahrenheit water to drive 100,000 BTUs per hour through the distribution system and into the building. Well, you plug those numbers into that formula and it shows you we can actually bring that requirement under design load from 180 down to 147. The graph shows you a couple of outdoor reset lines. It, on the far right, we're assuming a zero degree outdoor temperature. Our original condition required 180 degrees. Uh, after the building envelope improvements, we brought that down to 147. And the, the, the sloping lines just show you that under anything but design load conditions, any partial load condition, both those scenarios can drop off in proportion to that outdoor temperature. As it's getting warmer outside, we can significantly drop the water temperature in our system. And that is definitely part of, it should be part of any strategy to 
lower those water temperatures because the vast majority of the time we are not at design load conditions. We're at partial load conditions and we can benefit by uh, lowering the water temperature and, and getting better performance on our heat sources, whether they're renewable or fossil. Okay. Now, um, let's stay with this example where we were able to reduce the water temperature from 180 down to 147. And I, I want to, you know, one of the questions that a designer might ask is, all right, I know I need 147 degree Fahrenheit water design load, but let's say that it, for good performance on a heat pump or some other source, I don't really want to spend a lot of time over 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm going to ask a question. How much of the seasonal heating energy could I supply at water temperatures that don't exceed 120 degrees Fahrenheit? Okay. We know at design load, we got to go to 147. Well, to analyze this, we'll start off with bin temperature data. And that bar graph that you see is for Syracuse, New York. And it just shows you where they've taken the hourly outdoor temperatures for an entire year and categorized them into five degree increments. You can make another graph from that. Uh, basically, this is called a heating duration curve. And the vertical axis shows percent of design load. And the horizontal axis is, is hours when the load is greater than or equal to a given percentage shown on the vertical axis. And by plotting the data this way, the yellow area that you see under that curve is directly proportional to the total seasonal energy use, okay? So we're, what we're going to do is again, ask that question, how much seasonal heating energy can be supplied at or below 120 degrees Fahrenheit? So to find out, we just basically line up these graphs. Uh, and again, for Syracuse, um, over on the left, the graph shows that we need 147 degrees at design load. And if you dr follow that red line across, you'll see that lines up with 100% design load condition. And then we find 120 here and just draw that across. Now, that blue area is actually about six and a half percent of the total area under that curve. If you were to integrate that area, the blue area representing energy that has to be supplied at temperatures above 120 degrees Fahrenheit is only about six and a half percent of the total seasonal energy use. And keep this in, in perspective. We haven't modified the, the distribution system at all. We have brought the load from 100,000 down to 70,000. And even with the FIN2 baseboard system, this is telling us that the vast majority of that heating energy can be supplied uh, well within the capabilities of any of those heat sources we looked at earlier. Um, geothermal heat pump, air to water heat pump, certainly MICON boiler and so forth. So um, that's good news. That's good news. And it, it shows you the uh, cost effectiveness um, of dealing with building load reductions, which leads into another poll question. Uh, most of you listening are, I'm sure, are mechanical designers or contractors. So you focus a lot on the hardware uh, but how often do you recommend building envelope improvements that reduce design heating load? Is that part of your overall assessment of, uh, you know, how a client should best spend their money? Both yeah, sides. so this one's split up a little bit more. So almost always at 26%, frequently at 33%, occasionally 27%, seldom 10, never 5 Okay, well, so that is skewed in the right direction, I would say. Though. Yeah, it's definitely on the uh, positive again, side. There you go. Uh, I know, again, mechanical contractors, some of them don't offer the, the building energy services, but um, but I, I do think that market, uh, Bob, as you mentioned, where uh, contractors realize that it's, it's a complete system. So they're evaluating both the thermal performance of the building and uh, and the alternatives of, you know, changing the mechanical system, changing the building envelope yep. and where's the happy spot there in terms of cost effectiveness. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we've talked about, uh, and we've used the formula for reducing the load by um, improving the building envelope, but what about the other uh, approach, adding heat emitters? Okay. 
So I'm going to give you a procedure. And again, this procedure is all laid out in Hydronix 25, along with some examples, where what we're going to do is calculate how much additional baseboard we would need to bring a, a specific building from 180 degree supply water temperature all the way down to 120 degree temperature. That's, that's a pretty drastic drop. And essentially, I, I won't read this step by step. Um, you can get the PDF uh, after the webinar, or certainly you can read this in Hydronics. But essentially what you're doing is we're looking at, all right, let's start with what's there, how much baseboard is there, and how much output would we get at 120 degree water temperature. We're gonna subtract that from the design load of the building, and then we're, that leaves us with our deficit that we have to make up by adding heat emitters. And then we're, we're simply going to calculate how much additional baseboard we need at, a, at that 120 degree water temperature to make up for that deficit. So the logic here is very simple. And the graph shows you how fin tube baseboard output, and this is typical residential fin tube at two and a quarter inch square aluminum fins. It shows you the output per foot at different water temperatures, assuming 65 degree air and you can see it, that curve drops right down basically until you get down to a zero delta T between the entering air and the water. So we, we need a curve like this. This is a generic curve. Um, I've plotted this out for quite a few different baseboards and there's not a lot of variation as long as the fin element itself is uh, a nominal two and a quarter inch square with, uh, a, with uh, three quarter inch tubing in it. So, um, there's an example here and another formula that essentially just quantifies what the concept is, evaluate what's there, figure out what the deficit is, and then calculate how much baseboard. So the example is we've got a 40,000 BTU per hour building. It's got 120 feet of standard residential baseboard. And we wanna bring that water temperature down to 120 degrees. Anyway, we go through the steps and we plug our numbers into the formula and we get a what probably seems like a surprising, surprisingly large number here. It's telling us we need to add 154 feet of fin tube. And most of you are probably saying, where in the world am I gonna do this? And especially in kitchens and bathrooms, you just don't have the wall space. And I, I have been asked on occasion, can I, can I double stack this stuff? Can I, can I run it all the way around the room and then run another layer above it? And I, uh, I kind of grin at them and say, well, you know, I suppose you could, you're not gonna get double the performance and you better check the aesthetics with the homeowner. I don't think they're gonna be too happy about that. So I, I can't say it's an impossible scenario, but you can see it in many buildings, it's gonna be an impractical scenario in terms of how much additional fin tube. So let's say as a designer, you've evaluated that, and you kind of say, well, this doesn't look too good. What's my alternative? And one alternative would be to go to a high output baseboard. And there are at least two or three products on the market now in North America that are, that I, I would say would fit into this category. Uh, this particular one you can see has larger fins and two tubes in it. And there's a graph there that shows the output of that particular high output baseboard as as a function of water temperature and compares it to standard baseboard. It's roughly twice the output per foot at a given water temperature. Uh, you modify the formula slightly. Again, these steps are all outlined in Hydronix 25 and, and, and also the PDF of the slides here. So I'll kind of cut to the quick here. We will take our same example, a 40,000 BTU per hour load. It's got 120 feet of standard baseboard. We want to figure out how much additional high output baseboard we have to add to get that down to 120 degree water temperature. So we do the math and as you'd expect, it's going to be less than our previous example because it is high output versus standard. And it comes out to about 67 feet. And again, you have to evaluate that. Um, it's certainly less than 154 but it's still a lot of fin tube that has to be added and aesthetically, uh, you know, where's it going to go? How are you going to get access to it, especially in a, you know, existing building? Uh, it may or may not be a possibility, but you have the tool that you can use to evaluate this.
And again, you can do the what if scenarios. We could go back and say, well, maybe 120 was a little too aggressive. Maybe we wanna make it 130 and I'm sure it'll come out to a lower number. So these are our simple analytical tools to, to kind of put some numbers on the concepts and, and then allow you to take it from there. Now, in general, with other types of heat emitters, uh, panel radiators, fan coils, um, you know, uh, any, pretty much any type of heat emitter, the general concept is the amount of additional emitter you need is the design heating load minus how much you're going to get from your existing emitters. So, you know, here's another example using panel rads. We, we have this building at 40,000 BTUs per hour. It has 120 feet of uh, standard fin tube. Let's say we're gonna retrofit panel rads and I, I just happen to pick out one. Uh, it's 24 inches tall, 72 inches wide. It's a, it's a good size panel. And at an average water temperature of 115, uh, we're going to get about 4,200 BTUs per hour. So again, we, we just put the numbers in the formula. Our design load was 40,000 down here. This is how much the 120 feet of existing fin tube at that low water temperature is going to give us. So our deficit is about 22,480 BTUs per hour. Divide that by the output of the panels. And remember that output has to be based on that low water temperature. And we need 5.3 panels. So go to the wholesaler and say, I, I want 5.3 of these radiators and you're gonna get an odd look. So we gotta either round down or round up. Uh, if you round up to six, the water temperature requirement would go down slightly. If you round down to five, it would go up slightly. So again, it's, it's a pretty straightforward approach. And it does show that you can mix and match different types of emitters depending on aesthetics, budget, logistics of ex accessing piping. Um, where can I put these? Panel radiators uh, don't require as much wall space as, as fin tube. So have you, uh, our last poll question for today, have you designed or worked on projects where additional heat emitters were used to reduce the operating temperature of the system? So take a few seconds and uh, respond to that. All right, so we got um, yes at 41%, no at 59 Okay. Uh, so. Well, for the, for the no's, uh, this is something you want to consider. Uh, I think it's inevitable as, as the hydronics market moves ahead that we are going to see uh, a steady transition away from high temperature heat sources. And we are, we are facing, uh, especially in, in uh, areas where, you know, the Northeast comes to mind, Chicago area, uh, a lot of legacy hydronic systems that eventually are going to go over to a different type of heat source. So anyway, let's keep going. Um, outdoor reset, I won't spend a lot of time other than stress. Uh, you wanna take advantage of this in any scenario where we're trying to reduce water temperature. It's simply the idea that under part load conditions, whether we're dealing with fin tube, uh, the graph on the left over there is for a typical residential fin tube. And it shows 180 at design, but if we look at, for example, when it's um, 35 degrees out, which would, in this case would represent about half of design load, we're somewhere around 120 degree water. So again, we're well within the capabilities of those uh, renewable uh, heat sources at that point. The graph on the right is for a heated floor slab, a significantly lower design load temperature requirement, and Again, as we go to warmer ambient temperatures, we can go to lower and lower water temperatures. And again, think every time I can bring that water temperature down, I'm improving the performance of that heat source. Okay, now um, heat emitter fundamentals, just a few basic things. And, and some of you might be saying, well, aren't these various, aren't these obvious? And uh, over the years, just questions that I've been asked and so forth. Uh, no, I, I don't think they are obvious to everybody. Uh, so I wanna stress the heat output of any heat emitter always drops with decreasing water temperature. It's fundamental physics and thermodynamics. There's no, there's no smoke and mirrors where you can basically uh, reduce the water temperature and still keep the same heat output from a heat emitter, okay? 
And the second one, there's always some output from any heat emitter provided supply water temperature is above the room temperature. And that's in there for somebody that tells me, well, John, don't you know that fin tube baseboard stops working at water temperatures under 140 degrees Fahrenheit? Just stops, it just turns off. And actually it's not true. What, what stops is the numbers in the rating table. They don't typically rate, uh, you don't see printed ratings for standard fin tube below 140, but as long as there's a delta T, as long as there's a temperature difference between the water in that emitter and the surrounding air temperature, there's going to be some heat transfer. It may be very small, like uh, you know, 75 degree water in a fin tube when the air temperature is 65, isn't going to give you much output, but it's still adding some heat to the room. And uh, the other fundamental trade-off, um, there's always a trade-off between the total surface area of the emitters and think of that collectively. You could have a building with one type of emitter, two types, three types, but collectively they represent a total surface area for transferring heat from water into the building. As that area goes up, the supply water temperature goes down and vice versa. That's, that's a fundamental trade-off that every hydronic system designer needs to, to work with, okay? And just to show you a range, I, I made this graph up uh, to show you starting from the left at low water temperatures where we'd have a bare slab radiant floor, maybe in a very energy efficient building. It's conceivable we could run water temperatures in the 80 to 90 degree range and still get adequate heat output, even at design load. Uh, you have to crunch the numbers to find out exactly how that's possible, but I, I would definitely say it is possible. And then as we cover the slab or go to other types of panel heating, you see our, our bars kind of shift to the right. And then eventually as we go up towards the top of the graph where we get into traditional cast iron radiators and fin tube baseboard, uh, I, I use the word traditional because that's typically where those products have been sized at. Um, I don't like to design any system uh, at water temperatures over 200. Uh, I don't believe that's a code or a standard. Uh, I look at it as a safety issue. And quite honestly, today, uh, the days of 200 degree Fahrenheit water temperature are are disappearing. Uh, we, we are headed for more and more low temperature heat sources. And I've drawn a box around this. I drew a line essentially at 120. I'd like to suggest that as a number that designers would use for a supply water temperature at design load, any hydronic distribution system that you can design, regardless of what the emitters are, that can supply design load at 120 or lower if possible, is, is a good example of state-of-the-art design today. Okay, we're, we're definitely shifting on the left or towards the left on this graph. And finally, down at the bottom, uh, I put down, don't feel constrained to select heat emitters based on traditional supply water temperature. Uh, fin tube comes to mind. It, it, in a very energy efficient building, you may be able to operate fin tube at lower water temperatures and get adequate heat transfer. I don't wanna say don't ever use standard residential fin tube in any building with let's say a geothermal heat pump. It's, it's a small niche where you could do that and be successful, but Again, run the numbers. If you have a very low heating load, it could be a possibility. Okay. Now, another reality with any hydronic system is what I've called thermal equilibrium. And it's a simple idea. It's the idea that the water temperature in any hydronic system will only rise as necessary so that the rate of heat transfer into the water at the heat source equals the rate of heat release through the distribution system and the heat emitters. So in this case, we've got a system where we've got a 20,000 BTU per hour heat input rate from whatever that heat source is. And I've shown it with 31 feet of standard residential fin tube, and that's adequate to release 20,000 BTUs per hour. But to do so, the supply water temperature has to be 180 degrees Fahrenheit. So that system, if we had turned the controller on that boiler up to 200, that's, it would never get there. It doesn't have to go above, the water temperature doesn't have to rise above 180 to, to satisfy thermal equilibrium. 
So the water temperature only rises as necessary to get this balance. Now, let's keep the same heat source. All right, but we're going to we're going to increase from 31 to 111 feet of baseboard. And again, we could turn the aquastat on that heat source up to 200 degrees. The water temperature will go up to 120, and that's where it's going to stabilize. We're going to get a new thermal equilibrium where, again, 20,000 in equals 20,000 out, but it's happening at a lower water temperature, significantly lower. So it illustrates that point. Obviously, we've added a lot of heat emitter area here, and uh, we've brought down the water temperature substantially. And this is true for any heat emitter. Uh, in the case of an air handler over here on the left, if we go from a single uh, tube coil to a double tube to a triple tube and so forth, we're increasing the number of tube passes. We're increasing the size of the heat exchanger, the coil within that air handler. Our water temperature requirements are going to go down. Uh, over on the right, panel radiators. If we go to taller, wider, deeper radiators, uh, we're going to get lower water temperature. So however you get there, it's really the trade-off between surface area and the required water temperature. Another question that comes up, in fact, I, I believe one of the pre-submitted questions uh, dealt with, can I lower the water temperature by increasing the flow rate in the system? Um, and the answer is yes, but it's a, it's a very limited effect. And the graph on the left here shows you what, what I did is I took a 10 foot standard fin tube baseboard. We have a very detailed engineering model for how that performs as a function of flow and uh, air temperature. And I just varied the flow rate through that. And you can see at very, very low flow rates, that gray area down there, that's kind of a, an unknown area because we're very likely we'd be in laminar flow. We're going to have some increase in heat transfer. In fact, it's a pretty steep increase, but that's not really where we want to operate that with laminar flow. But once we get up to roughly about one gallon per minute, you can see that if we go to higher flow rates, the output's going up, but it's a very marginal gain. So unless you're running things at extremely low flow rates, uh, changing the flow rate, going to a higher flow rate doesn't produce much of a, an effect. And it's a similar scenario with a radiant floor circuit. Here we've got a 300 foot circuit of half inch packs in a four inch bare slab. And again, I just plotted the heat output, assuming uh, this assumes 110 degree inlet water temperature. And you can see at low flow rates that output is going up. But once we get up to and above nominal flow rates, in this case, one gallon per minute in that half inch circuit, uh, we do get a small increase, but it's very limited. So the other thing you want to remember is when you increase flow rate, you're increasing uh, the pumping power requirement substantially. In, in theory, your pumping power is going up with the cube of the flow rate. So doubling the flow rate would produce a lot more pump input power. So I don't feel it's a good strategy to try to overpower inadequate heat transfer by just blasting the water through the system. And of course, you get up into high flow velocities, you get noise, erosion, uh, uh, just bad things happen. So in general, you're much better off to add surface area than you are to try to push the water through the system faster. Now, let's start talking about the hardware options here and what time we've got left. Uh, a very common piping topology for legacy baseboard systems is a series loop or what's called a split series system down below. These are these are common residential like commercial uh, layouts. And they, they can function, but they don't have a lot of versatility. Uh, they're basically single zone systems. There is uh, the need to increase the length of the baseboard per unit of load as we go from one baseboard to the next because we have a series temperature drop. Each baseboard along the path is getting a lower water temperature than the baseboard upstream of it. So even though the piping is simple, uh, it, it really isn't a very versatile system. So our fundamental approach to this is going to be let's convert that from a series system into a parallel system. And this is just showing you an example where we're starting with that series system up at the top. 
And what we're going to do is find where we can access these heat emitters at different locations. And, and again, every project's going to be different. Uh, in some cases, the piping for fin tube would punch down through the floor, and if there's a basement or a crawl space, you can gain access to it. In other cases, it might be buried in the wall. So I, I can't say this is always going to be the best approach, but fundamentally, you need to look at where can I access that series loop and make what I'll call strategic cuts in it, and then take those segments that we've cut the loop into and bring them back to a manifold using typically half inch PEX or PEX aluminum PEX tubing. Um, so the parallel system down here shows four parallel circuits. And you'll see in some cases I've added some baseboard and in other cases I've added some panel radiators just to show that we can make a, a mix there, okay? One of the nice things about a parallel system is each parallel circuit gets the same supply water temperature. And that may actually improve the, the heat output of some of the baseboards that were near the end of that previous series circuit. Um, this particular parallel system is being shown as a single zone, but the next slide will show you it's very easy to convert that over into a zone system. And I just want to point out there are many uh, fittings on a market that allow you to make these transitions from PEX or PEX aluminum PEX over to copper very, very simply. And of course, running the flexible half inch PEX tubing back to the manifold is, is uh, easier than dealing with copper. Now, here's that same piping topology, but I've made some changes. I've added thermostatic radiator valves and they can be in several different varieties. Uh, this one happens to be a valve in the piping, but with a capillary tube up to a wall mounted adjuster. Um, this one over here is just a standard TRV where the uh, thermostatic operator screws down onto the valve. And then uh, some panel radiators actually have the valve built right in, so you just add the thermostatic operator. So now we've got a four zone system. And I've also changed from a fixed speed pump to a variable speed pump. So as these thermostatic valves are opening and closing, that pump is going to sense an attempt to change differential pressure. And if it's set for constant differential pressure, it's going to adjust its speed automatically, very state of the art. And because we have a variable speed pump here and we, we probably are gonna use the fixed speed pump to go back to our heat source, uh, one of the things you can put in between is a hydraulic separator. Uh, that's going to allow those pumps to operate independently of each other. It's also going to do the air separation, dirt separation, and especially in a retrofit, if there's any ferrous metal in the system, which in older systems, cast iron radiators, steel or iron piping, uh, I'd recommend using a magnetic separator. We want to capture those uh, iron oxide particles. We don't want those to be uh, clogging up our variable speed pump. So we've gone from a single zone series system into a four zone uh, parallel system, and we've added several state-of-the-art uh, details along the way, the hydraulic separator, the variable speed pump, and so forth. Same system, only difference here, we're using manifold valve actuators instead of thermostatic valves. So if you want to put four thermostats in and coordinate those back through a, uh, a relay center, uh, there are uh, uh, products to do that, and then the manifold valve actuators just screw onto the manifold. So we're, again, we have a four zone system. We're still using the variable speed pump and the uh, four function hydraulic separator. Uh, a caution, if we have a system that has a high temperature boiler and we make modifications and we're gonna operate that system at much lower temperatures, think 120 at design load, we've gotta protect that existing boiler. That boiler in its previous life in that existing high temperature system operated well above the dew point the vast majority of the time. All of a sudden now we're putting that boiler into a system that's going to hold it below the dew point of those exhaust gases and we can trash the boiler and the vent piping. And if it's going through an old masonry chimney or clay flue chimney, we can do a lot of damage. Uh, so again, there are products like the thermal protect valve here that Basically, it's just a thermostatic mixing valve with high flow capacity, and this allows the boiler to operate above the dew point temperature 
and contribute heat into a low temperature system. So uh, whatever heat emitters are being used, don't forget to protect that existing boiler if you take the water temperature down. Uh, this schematic just shows a general idea that when we're adding a low temperature heat source to an existing system, we wanna add it upstream of the uh, boiler, existing boiler. That's so that we have the coolest water coming back from the load, uh, making, uh, making that available to the low temperature heat source. Uh, if we switch the order of those around and if they were operating at the same time, uh, obviously the boiler would be adding some heat and that's going to create higher water temperature into the low temperature heat source, which from what we saw earlier is going to bring the performance down. Okay, here's an example of that. This is a, a piping where we've, I've taken that distribution system we just looked at, hang on a second. We've taken that distribution system and we're tying it into a pellet boiler and thermal storage. That's our low temperature heat source. So you can see our coolest water is going into the set of closely spaced T's there. And then we're tying in our existing boiler along with a uh, anti-condensation valve, we're tying that in downstream. So these parts and pieces come together and the general topology here would apply if, for example, if we're gonna tie a geothermal heat pump in instead of that pellet boiler. Um, there are several design guidelines here. Again, I, I just give an amount of time. I don't wanna read all these to you, but we've talked about pretty much all of these as we've gone through the webinar. They are in Hydronics 25. Um, there is no one single approach. You've got to evaluate each project uh, individually. Obviously, different owners have different perspectives on aesthetics and cost and so forth. Um, certainly want to try to use as much of the existing piping as possible, assuming that piping's in good shape. Okay. Um, so I, I want to finish up here. Hopefully, you have a time for a couple questions. Uh, in Hydronics 25, there are three example systems, and I've got a couple of them here. Let's say we're starting with this system. It's an oil-fired cast iron boiler going off to a split uh, fin tube baseboard. And over here on the uh, right, and let me just move that for a second. Oops. Uh, here's what the owner wants to do. They want to convert to a gas-fired ModCon boiler. They want to convert that single zone system into a four zone system. They want to use electronic thermostats, and they're going to use some type of high output fin tube. They've chosen that as the supplemental heat emitters that they'd like to use. So it's a specific combination of, let's say, owner requirements or job requirements. All right, so here's one way that that could be done. Um, so you see the ModCon boiler is the heat source now. We're putting a hydraulic separator in there to do uh, the hydraulic separation as well as air, dirt, and magnetic particle. We're using a manifold system with manifold valve actuators and thermostats. And then here's our four circuits now. And again, when a given zone thermostat calls for heat, its associated manifold valve actuator would open and allow flow to go through that circuit. The variable speed pump will adjust as necessary to the differential pressure that we have there. And um, again, I've, I've tried to draw some shading around what are now the four different zones in that system, okay? Now, I don't wanna say this is the only way this could be done. There may be some other opportunities to do this, but this, this ties together with some of the uh, details that we talked about earlier. Now, the other system uh, is a, an older system. We've got some uh, cast iron radiators that are in a two pipe system. We've got a cast iron boiler with, uh, with an oil burner in it. So what do we wanna do? Well, let's say the owner says, I wanna add a geothermal heat pump but I'm gonna keep that existing boiler because I, I want it as a backup. And I, I'm gonna use panel radiators rather than fin tube for my supplemental heat emitters, okay? Uh, we're gonna use a thermostatic radiator valves rather than thermostats for zoning. We're gonna use PEX tubing for the new piping runs. And because of the fact that we're bringing that water temperature down, we want to uh, protect the boiler against condensation. So let's look at the heat source side of the system. Uh, basically, the geothermal heat pump's been added in parallel with the boiler. 
And you can see that uh, the boiler does have an anti-condensation valve on it. This scenario would allow either of these heat sources to operate as the sole heat source or with the right controls, they could operate simultaneously. We're separating those heat sources with a hydraulic separator and we're using a variable speed pump to uh, create flow in the distribution. Now, the detail on the distribution system is basically we're tying panel rads in parallel with the existing cast iron radiators and we're going to operate this combination of a, a new panel rad with the existing cast iron radiator. We're going to operate that as a group by using a single radiator valve and that's gonna be actuated using a capillary tube going up to that temperature setting knob. And uh, that's it. We're gonna use some PEX tubing. We're teeing in here and down here and we're running PEX tubing up to the isolation valve on the uh, thermostatic, uh, I'm sorry, on a panel rad. And I just wanna point out, we've got a built-in valve here as well as an existing radiator valve. So we have the ability to balance flows out as we need to. So what does that look like uh, if we put it all together? Uh, as much as I can fit on the screen there, I'm showing three separate segments uh, where we could have different size cast iron radiators, different size panel rads added to it. But if you grasp the concept of how we're, we're using um, a panel rad uh, radiator valve and we're building essentially more surface area into each of these zones, and then we're uh, tying these other details like variable speed and uh, we're using a two-stage controller to operate that. So um, there's you know, unlimited possibilities on doing this. So I think that's it. Good job, Siggy. Hope the project's come along well and we'll, we'll talk to everybody on the next one. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Huck. Take care. See ya.